Good morning, Champion Forest family. We are so glad that you're here. And here at North Klein, we are just that family. And so whether you're watching us on Facebook Live or our Champion Forest online church, or even perhaps on our YouTube channel, we are glad that you are here. And you know, I'm almost positive that there is someone that you would love to invite to join you in fellowship this morning. So go ahead, tag somebody, have a watch party, invite people, share it, post it, make comments, let people know that you're watching. Pray for each other. Let each other know that you've been thinking about each other in the comments section. And of course, always know that we've got all kinds of things. If you're watching, especially on Champion Forest online, we've got a notes section so you can follow along. But most importantly, we want you to be in worship with us. And so we're grateful this morning to be worshiping together as a family and as a church. And talk about family. It's been so fun this week watching through our social media to see how you guys have been blessing each other as we've been doing our family fun challenge. So thank you for those who have participated and have gone out and to love on each other. But this morning, let's just ready our hearts to worship and to praise God and to let him know that we are his people and we are ready to celebrate him. Champion Force, come on up and get moving this morning. I can see the clouds rolling. I can hear the winds, they try to shake me. And I will not be moved. My feet are on the rock. I can feel, I can feel the waters rise. I can hear the howling thighs that haunt me and fear won't hold me now my feet are on the rock come on when i feel when i feel my whole the morning light I can feel the joy on the horizon here my faith is found I stand on solid ground when I feel my hope I'm about to break I will cling to your unchanging grace let the waters come in the earth and break in the rain. A solid rock, I stand all of the ground is sinking sand. So stomp your feet and clap your hands, I feet are on the rock. On Christ, a solid rock, I stand all of the ground is sinking sand. So stomp your feet and clap your hands, I feet are on the rock. On Christ, a solid rock, I stand all of the ground is sinking sand. So stomp your feet and clap your hands, I feet are on the rock. When I feel my hope to break, I will cling to your unchanging grace. Let the waters come in the earth give way. I'll be dancing in the rain. When I feel my hope come down to break, I will cling to your unchanging grace. Let the waters come. in the rain. My feet are on the 
Good morning, my Champion Force family. So excited to be with you guys this morning from wherever you are, whatever platform that you're worshiping with us. We are excited that you chose to worship with Champion Force North Line as we get to praise our rock, our redeemer, our strength. If you are new this morning, if this is your first time to be with us, we would love for you to do this. We have a number that's going to show here in just a second for you to text your first and last name, and one of our ministers will get with you. We would love just to be able to connect with you, see where you're coming from, and see where you're worshiping with us this morning. If you've got kids, championforce.org slash update slash kids. If you go on there, get the listening God. We're here in just a moment for your kids to stay engaged, connected during our message with Pastor Stephen here in just a little bit. Again, we are so excited that you're here this morning. We just hope that you can just feel free to worship where you are. We have confidence that his presence is with us right now. You are here. You're moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You're working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, you're touching every heart. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, you're healing every heart. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, you are here. Turning lives around, I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You're mending every heart. I worship you. Even when I don't see it, you're working. 
even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. We're making miracle work. Promise keeping, hide in the darkness. My God, that is who you
Champion Forest, we are so glad that we have the opportunity to worship in this place. But part of worship is also in how we give. And it's been awesome to see how we're able to give in a way that honors the Lord. Whether it's much or little, God will bless it and God will use it. So if you'll just take this time, if you're not already giving online, to look at how, if you go to our push pay or championforce.org backslash giving, you can find all the many ways that you can give here at North Klein. And we're awesome and able to see how God can use that to bless his people and to use it in awesome and mighty ways. And so would you just pray, for, pray with me as we pray over this offering? right now. Heavenly Father, we just come before you and we just thank you and we just praise you for who you are. We thank you for the way that you give to us as your children and you bless us with everything that we need. God, we thank you for your provision. God, we thank you for the many ways that we can worship you and we can honor you with all that we are and all that we do. So God, we just give you the rest of this service. God, we give you the rest of this week and we ask you to do a new and awesome thing, not only in us, but God through us. We praise you, Lord, and it's in your precious name that I pray, amen. so hard to see it took me so long to believe it that you choose someone like me to carry your victory perfection could never earn it you give what we don't deserve it Take the broken things and raise them to glory. You are my champion, and giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you won, I am who you say I am. heavenly place undefeated with the one who has conquered it all now i can finally see it you're teaching me how to receive it so let all the striving
And so, Father, we are just so blown away that you would let us lift our voice to you, our King, to our Savior, our Rock, and our Redeemer. And so, Lord, just as Moses talked about in Exodus, is that you will fight our battles. We just need to be silent. And so now, Father, we just listen, and we listen only to your word and your voice as you guide, as you direct. Lord, as you heal. Lord, as you clean and you just mop up our brokenness and you make us so whole with your righteousness. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for these people. Thank you for this church. Thank you for letting us sing to you and worship with you. And now we just come to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning again. So glad that you guys are with us. A lot has happened this week. A lot of fun things, a lot of good things, not the least of which was Friday night. The Astros kicked off their very strange 2020 season. And if you just think about the Astros for a second, they're, they're all trying to do one thing, right? 25 players, coaches, everybody else together, they have one very specific and very distinct mission. All of the fly balls, all of the batting practice, all of the pitches, everything that they do at the end of the season, their goal is to win another World Series. No trash cans this time, right? Just win another World Series. One mission, and they're all pushing towards it. But the Astros aren't the only organization around or that exists that has a mission statement that drives everything that they do and everyone in their organization. Here's a couple really interesting ones. Google. Everybody's used Google. Everybody knows of Google. Their mission statement, if you don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a very lofty goal. It's very broad, but here it is. It's to gather all of the world's information and to make it accessible and useful for all people. That's what drives everything that they do. Chick-fil-A has a great mission statement as well. Chick-fil-A's mission statement is this, is to glorify God by being a faithful steward of all that is entrusted to us and to have a positive influence on all who come in contact with Chick-fil-A. It makes you want to go buy chicken. You can't because it's Sunday, but tomorrow you can go buy chicken because their mission statement is so, so good. So like Google and and Chick-fil-A and the Astros, they're all driving towards something. A very specific thing is a group of people that's gathered together. And, And I want you to know that the same is true for us. The same is true for the church family. When we open our Bibles and look at the words from Jesus, you can do that. It's in Matthew 28. We'll be there in just a minute. We see that that we, that the the church family that, that, that gathers together locally all over the world, that we have a specific mission, a direct command from Jesus on what it is you and I are supposed to be giving our lives to. So all of the things that we do, all the little things, all the big things, all should be pointing together towards this one thing that Jesus has called us to do. And and before I read it, I want to be very, very clear that this is who we are, right? This is our calling. This is our mission from God. It's not something that we just participate in when we go to church, right? This isn't a program. This isn't a periodic thing that we dip in and that we dip out of. This is a way that you and I are called to live as followers of Jesus, who gather together to make up the church family. Let me just give you the spoiler alert up front. Here's the end at the very beginning, and that's this. The mission of the church, very clearly, very plainly, is to make disciples. The mission of the church is to make disciples. In Matthew 28, Jesus tells his followers, and that extends to you and to me, if, if we today are followers of Jesus as well, he tells us that we're to go into the world, And that's not just overseas, that's not just on mission trips some places, those are good, but it's not exclusive to that. We're to go to to where we live, and as we do, 
we're called to share the good news of Jesus, inviting other people to trust in him, and then we're supposed to build them up, teaching them to do all that Jesus has called us to do. And it's important that we're walking through this today. It fits naturally with what we've been talking about. We've been walking through a series called We Are Family, looking at it the past couple of weeks. And if you'll remember two weeks ago, we looked at who we are. And we understood that, that as Christians gathered together, that, that we are a family following Jesus as one body. That is who we are as Champion Forest North Klein. And then last week we looked at why it is that we gather together and we saw that God's word calls God's people to gather and gathering together means growing. Growing with one another, growing in our relationship with Jesus. Gathering means growing. And this morning we're looking at what we do, the, the mission of the church. And we just heard and we're going to read God's word to see it, that the mission of the church is to make Disciples, And I've started using a phrase that, that I like that helps us make that a little bit more understandable than, than make disciples. Listen to this. Followers of Jesus invite others to follow Jesus. Right? Followers of Jesus should be inviting others to follow Jesus. And I want that phrase to stick. I want it to roll around in our minds. I want it to roll around in our hearts. It's so simple and it's so true. And I pray that that would be my heartbeat and that it would be your heartbeat as well. That as a church family, we would be followers of Jesus, inviting other people to come with us as we follow Jesus. Let's read together. Matthew 28, starting in verse 18, our Bible says this, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So just look in your Bibles. Right? Look at those verses right there. It's very clear. Right in the middle of these sentences, right, which are Jesus' final words, to his disciples, that, that you and I, as people who follow Jesus, are called to make disciples. We're called to invite other people to come with us as we follow him. But before we jump into verse 19, and, and verse 19 is where that command is given, we can't overlook what we see in verse 18, because all of this, our mission is hinged on the authority of Jesus. So as we seek to clarify what we're all about, as we seek to understand our mission as a church, we've got to understand and believe in the authority of Jesus. If you're taking notes, that's our first thing this morning. We have to believe in the authority of Jesus. Our mission to make disciples is made possible because of this. And as we read through the book of Matthew, that's where, where our verse is found this morning in Matthew 28. And tw Matthew 28 is the last chapter of the book of Matthew, but the rest of the book and all the other gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are where we find that the life of Jesus, and all of those gospels, we see that Jesus has authority over all things. Here's some examples. Just thinking about it, Jesus has authority over nature. What did he do? Can you think of any examples of that? He calmed the storm, right? And he flattened the sea. Jesus has authority over nature. Jesus has authority over disease. Jesus brought healing to many people throughout his time here on earth, right? He helped the guy that couldn't walk, regained strength in his legs. He healed uh, blind eyes. He healed uh, deaf ears. He healed people with leprosy. Jesus has authority over our bodies and disease. We saw Jesus has authority over demons as he cast demons out of people who were afflicted by them. Jesus has authority over sin. He was tempted over and over and over, and the Bible tells us that Jesus was without sin. Perfect obedience to God the Father while he was on earth. And by the way, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection also frees you and I from the bondage of sin as well. And we see that Jesus has authority over death. Jesus brought people back to life, but not only did he do that, Jesus himself who was dead, buried in the tomb for three days, rose from the grave as well. Jesus has authority over death. I hope that you know and understand and can see from God's word that there is nothing outside of the authority of Jesus. And as we read what, what we see next, moving from verse 18 to verse 19, the, the mission that he's calling all of us into, I want to make sure that we read it in the right 
the correct context, knowing that, that Jesus is sending us as one who has the authority to send us. And not only the authority to send us, Jesus is sending us as the one who has authority over all things. And with that authority, we get to verse 19 where Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Our second point from God's Word is, is the command of Jesus this morning. It's make disciples. If you're taking notes, if you're writing it down, you can write that everywhere that you, that you see to keep that in front of us. Make disciples or invite others to follow Jesus, because that's what a disciple truly is, right? Go and make disciples. And as we read that, and as we process that, let me just be, be very clear and, and very honest, right? Th this command here, it's not, it's not a comfortable call, inviting believers and, and followers of Jesus to simply come and sit and watch. He didn't tell his disciples, hey, you guys hang out right over here. And if somebody walks up to you, then begin to tell them about me. And, and if we're not careful, right, if we're not careful, that's, that's where you and I are going to end up. And I, I just need to point this out. I think it's obvious, but I'm going to say it. Jesus isn't commanding us to sit back and watch. When we read the command of Jesus in verse 19, the mission that he's giving us as his followers, it is a command to participate. It is a command to engage. It is a command to share the hope that we have in him with the rest of the world around us. Several years ago, I got a phone call. Someone in, invited me to come and to share the good news of Jesus with someone that was sick. This individual had, had cancer. They were not doing too terribly well. And, and somebody just reached out to me and said, hey, he needs someone that can encourage him and that someone that can show him what it means to follow Jesus. And I, I jumped at the opportunity and said, I love to come and connect with this young man. And so I did. And, and I went down to the hospital where he was and, and I shared the hope of Jesus with this guy. And, and the first visit, he, he didn't become a follower of Jesus. And that was okay. We connected. We built a relationship. The second visit, we spent some time together as well. The third visit that I was with him, this young man decided to follow Jesus. He understood what God's word says. He understood how much God loved him and how much God desired a relationship with him. So laying in his hospital bed, he placed his faith, his hope, his trust in Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. He became a child of God. He moved from death to life in that very moment as he decided to follow Jesus. And a couple weeks later, in that same hospital, he passed away. He stepped out of this life into eternity straight into the arms of Jesus. The Bible says for followers of Jesus to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. And I had the privilege and the honor of, of remembering him and celebrating his life at his funeral. And, and after I was finished preaching at the funeral, I, I stepped out and I began to connect with some of his friends and family. And, and here's what I'm getting at. There were several people who were followers of Jesus, who were Christians that, that were in that young man's life. And, and many of them at that funeral came up and said, we are so thankful, so thankful that you shared the gospel with him. We have been thinking and hoping and praying for so long for someone to go and to share Jesus, to invite him to follow Jesus. And I started to think about that on my drive home. And, and what we had was a lot of people who were followers of Jesus that were hoping someone else would go and ask this young man or this young man's family to follow Jesus. Right? Do you see sort of what's going on there? They were followers of Jesus hoping that someone else would ask that family to follow Jesus. And, and my prayer is this, that, that all of us who are a part of our church family that all of us who are members here at Champion of Forest North Klein and everything that we do, every time we gather, every time that we talk, every time we, we eat lunch with one another or connect wherever it is that we go, that, that we would be encouraged, that we would be equipped, and that we would understand that this is for all of us, that this is our mission as followers of Jesus to invite other people to come alongside us 
and to follow Jesus. And as we think about that, as we think about extending that invitation, as we think about the command that Jesus has given us right here, you might be wondering, okay, what exactly does that mean? I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. What does it mean? How do I ask someone else to come alongside me and to follow Jesus? And that's a great question because for us to, to do it and to live out the command that Jesus has given us, we have to understand it. So let me invite you again to look at your Bibles in verse 19, that middle verse right there. And the first word that we see in that verse is go. Now, we might think that go is a command, but, it, but if you were to read that in the Greek, you would understand that the word go here is passive. Right? The word go is not a command. And a way to understand that word at the beginning of the sentence is almost like an assumption. Jesus is assuming, he's saying, listen, you're going to go. You're going to live your life. You're going to be in the world. In fact, some people actually translate that first word go to, to as you go. So read it with that in mind. As you go, as you're living life, do what? Look at the next phrase, make disciples. And this wasn't a new thing for people that had followed Jesus. Think back to when Jesus first called the 12 disciples, the fishermen, the tax collector, the others, into a relationship with him. He said, follow me and I will make you to become what? You can finish it at home. If you know, tell somebody in your living room with you, hey, this is what Jesus was going to turn them into. Fishers of what? Into fishers of men. So simply put, in our language, a disciple is someone that follows. So, so keep thinking with me. A disciple of Jesus is someone that understands how much they're loved by Jesus. It's people that understand the good news of Jesus that we see in the Bible. It's people that understand that our sin has separated us from a holy and loving God and that God loves us enough that he sent Jesus into the world to die on the cross as a willing sacrifice for our sins. And disciples, followers of Jesus, are people that trust in him and him alone for our forgiveness and for a relationship with God. So disciples of Jesus, that's you and I, right, are are people who believe in him, who place their faith and trust in him, who follow him and him alone. And guess what? Disciples of Jesus invite other people to do all of that, right? When Jesus says make disciples, he's saying get them to do what you have done. Get them to trust me the way that you've trust me. Get them to place their faith in me the way that you have placed your faith in and me. Simply put, making disciples is inviting other people to follow Jesus. Now it's possible to gather with the church family, to gather online like we're doing right now. It's possible to gather in this room and fill it up when we can fill it up again. It's possible to meet for other believers for, for lunch or have your life group, have uh, you know life group tailgates out here in our parking lot. All of those things are going on right now, but it's possible to, to gather, to participate, to engage with the church family and to never make a disciple. To never invite someone who doesn't know Jesus to follow Jesus. I mean, think about that. It's possible to be a part of all the other things that are going on and to never participate in the mission that Jesus has called his church to. Please listen to me. Guys, if we're obedient, if we're living out what we see in God's word, if we are following Jesus... We're going to be inviting other people to follow Jesus as well. We can't miss this. We can't be distracted by other things, even good things. I pray for us. I pray that that as a church family, we would be about what God has told us to be about. That as people who know Jesus, who love Jesus, who follow Jesus, that you and I would be faithful to share him with others as well. 1 Peter A letter a little bit further back in your Bible. You can flip over to that if if you'd like. But in in the very first chapter of 1 Peter, God's Word tells us that as disciples, as followers of Jesus, that that people that they are following Jesus have been born into what the Bible calls a living hope. Right? We have this hope in our hearts that, that lives in and through each one of us. And in that same letter, chapter 3 of that letter, God's Word commands us to always be ready to share the hope that is within us to always be ready to share the hope that we have because of Jesus. And and just like you, I have talked to a lot of people in the past couple of weeks and months who need hope. People who need hope. People who are struggling. There is so much going on in our world right now. I prayed yesterday 
with someone that's sick. We all know people that are sick right now, and we're praying for them, and, and they need hope. We know people that are walking through financial hardships, people who've had the loss of their jobs. There are people and students and kids right now are falling into the same situation. There's uncertainty about school and what that's going to look like. There's uncertainty about the future and, and dozens more situations. I'm sure that the world has around us that where people need hope. And as followers of Jesus, as the church family, as people who have been saved by God, we know that in Jesus there is hope that transcends the problems of this world. We know that in Jesus there is a hope that can bring peace and joy even in the midst of the problems of this world. We know that in Jesus there's a hope that can and will calm the hearts of those that trust in him in every situation and every trial that we come across. And as we read our Bibles, we see that, that you and I, that the church family, are called to share that hope with the world around us, making disciples, inviting other people to follow Jesus, right? Here's the thing. If you were to flip back from Matthew 28, just a couple of chapters, to Matthew chapter 22, Jesus very clearly instructs us as his followers to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then right after that, Jesus says we're called to love our neighbor's as ourselves. When we think about inviting people to follow Jesus, when we think about making disciples, we've got to understand that inviting someone else to follow Jesus is the deepest act of love we could ever express towards them. And as we understand that inviting someone to follow Jesus is this deep act of love, this deep act of friendship, as we meet people, as we connect with people, as we build relationships with people, we're going to seek to love them enough to invite them to follow Jesus, right? When we love them, when we understand that inviting them to follow Jesus is this act of love, it is always going to be on the front of our minds. And listen, not just some of us, not just life group leaders and deacons, but our entire church family loving the world around us enough to share the hope of Jesus with us, with the world. Every one of us, right? Not, not just in a program, not just an organized effort. If you look back at verse 19 again, the very first word, go, that means as you go, as you live life, right, we're going to be doing this. We're going to walk through seasons as a church where we try to mobilize everybody together. We're going to have programs to, to equip. We're going to do things like faith and life on mission. We're going to send and mobilize our church family on mission trips to spread out and to share the gospel, right? We're, we're hoping to be able to share one of those seasons with you in just a couple of days as we plan and dream and pray about what that could look like for our church. But the hope is this, that every time we do one of those things, every time we gather our church family for one of those specific seasons, our hope is that people would trust Christ. And our hope is also that as a church family, we would be equipped and encouraged to do that same thing in every season of life that we walk through. And listen, I'm thankful to hear stories from our church family all the time from, from you. I, I get emails, I get texts, I get phone calls from you as you celebrate what God has done when you invite others to follow Jesus. And this morning, I want to encourage you with one of those stories. We, we've got Amy that's here with us, and she understands what God's called us to do and the mission that he has for us. And this morning, she's graciously agreed to share with us a story about where God's been at work as she invited one of her friends to follow Jesus. So Amy, why don't you walk us through just a little bit of time where you were able to share the hope that God has uh, in you with someone that you care about. Um, so it started back in ninth grade. Oh, let me get, let, we need to get you a microphone. Would, would you hand her that microphone real quick? Technical difficulties, the mic is coming. No worries. Come on up here, Amy. It's already on. Just have a seat and start talking. We'll be able to hear you. Um, so it started back in ninth grade um, at the lunch table, and I decided one day to sit with my friend at the, um, yeah. That's okay, keep okay. going, you're good. So I decided to sit with my friend, and um, ever since then, like, our relationship was growing, and just getting to know each other, get closer, hanging out all the time, and there was just, inside of me, I knew that this was what I was called for, for such a time as this, and Months go on, and we got closer with some other people, and I invited them to come to church, and they all loved it, and I was just giddy. I was so happy. That's awesome. And so I kept inviting them, but a lot of different responsibilities and 
uh, sports were getting in the way. And so I just decided to start praying. I kept saying, Lord, like, you know, use me. And I pray that one day I get to see them come to know you. And so I just kept praying and deciding to love them through my actions. Because sometimes the subject of Christianity could be a little sticky and messy and to them sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so um, I just kept loving them through actions and praying for them. And then a few months go on again, and we got closer with some people in the church. And I went to our school. And so we all decided to start coming to midweek together. And then the responsibilities in sports came and got in the way again. So I just decided to keep praying again, just praying that they would come to know Jesus. And so a um, few months go on again, and then I, I decided one day to text my friend um, and just ask her the faith question because we had had a good relationship, and I just I couldn't fall asleep at night. I was super restless. Now, tell us real quick. So she texted her friend the faith question. Tell us what the faith question is so people understand yes. uh, how bold you were in that moment <laughs> to, to do what God's called you to do. So the faith question is, if you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven or hell? And um, I, I texted her that, and I went to bed because um, I had a golf tournament the next morning, and I waited to open it for a while, and I just let it stir within her. Like, we had a conversation about it, but she was kind of confused, and so I explained it, but I just let it stir within her. And then a few weeks go by, and she was texting me. She's like, hey, Amy, like, I've really been thinking about what you've been asking me, mm -hmm. and I really think I'm ready to follow Jesus. And so I was just ecstatic. I was so happy. And because of quarantine, I got to lead her through Christ on, over FaceTime, but um, just seeing her and how bad she wanted it and just even in her prayer saying, okay, Lord, like yeah. use me to speak through this person or use me to do this. Lord, let me follow you like wholeheartedly. Yeah. And just seeing her just pray that, like literally both of us were in tears. Yeah. And just seeing the, awesome. the prayers answered because through one of your best friends. I mean, you want to see your closest people and family come to know Christ. Absolutely. And so being able to just see that answered prayer, answered prayer just was amazing. That's so cool. And God, God is good. Let me just tell you a couple of things. When you said that she texted you and said, I'm ready to follow Jesus. I don't even know if you realize it, but you got this huge smile on your face. Like even while you're up here, just sharing that. And I did too. And I think that the people that are in here with us did too, but they've got masks on and it's sort of hard to see the guys and the cameras in the very back. But I know underneath those masks, there were smiles. And people that are watching this right now in their living rooms, as you said that, got a huge smile on their face because there is this unbelievable joy that we know comes from following Jesus. And your friend got to experience that. And I just want to point out a couple of things about Amy's story with her friend. Uh, when Jesus said, go, as you go, as you're living life, think about where it was that, that Amy met and connected with this friend. It, it was at school, right? Just a, something that you, you do, right? As a student, you go to school. So she was going where God had her go on a regular basis, and she built a relationship, and not overnight, not the next day, not with your first conversation, but over a relationship, over a season of time, right? As you prayed, as you invested, and as you loved, you were able to invite your friend to follow Jesus. And I don't know if you guys caught that at the end, but when her friend prayed to follow Jesus, her friend asked God to use her to lead another friend into a relationship with Jesus as well. Listen, disciples of Jesus are followers of Jesus who invite others to follow Jesus. And there's no time limit on when this is. It doesn't have to be, you know, I need to be a believer or a follower for five years or ten years before I can do it. I mean, right when we know Jesus, we've got all we need to invite others to follow Jesus, I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for your story. Thanks for having the guts to come and share this with us this morning. And our hope and prayer is this, is that it's an encouragement to all of us that we can do what God has called us to do. She can't hear you because you're at home watching this, but give it up for Amy. Clap for her. Let's celebrate and encourage what God's done in her life. Amy, thank you so much. We're so incredibly proud of you and what God has done in you. And here's what I, what I want you to think think about, right? A lot of times we think about our faith as a very personal thing, and it is. 
It is one of the most personal things, maybe the most personal thing that we've got. Our faith is personal, but it was never meant to be private. Our faith in God is something that we're supposed to share, that we're supposed to invite other people into as well. Look back at verse 19. Go and make disciples. Go invite other people to follow after Jesus. And he goes on to say, invite other people, make disciples where? Of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So as we read this and think about who it is we're supposed to make disciples of, who we're supposed to invite to follow Jesus, it's people at the lunch table, Amy, it's people in our office building, it's people on our teams, it's people uh, in our neighborhoods, it's the people that we run into at restaurants, people that we have a relationship with, or people that we might just see and, and have one connection with at any point in our lives, all People. And then Jesus continues. He says, baptizing them, right? A, a continuation of following Jesus is right here in baptism. We never see a command to baptize people who don't believe. We're supposed to baptize people who become followers of Jesus. And baptism is that, that public profession that identifies us with Christ, with the church family. It doesn't save us, right? It doesn't make us a Jesus follower. It's to show people that we now are Jesus followers. It's that first step of obedience when we enter into a relationship with Christ. And it's true from the very beginning of the church. If you look at the, the early church in Acts chapter 2, when Peter, one of the disciples, stands up and preaches to the masses, they say, hey, we, we want to follow Jesus. What do we do? And he says, repent, trust in Jesus, and be baptized as a, as a symbol, that public profession that you're followers of Jesus. And that's why when you and I invite other people to follow Jesus, we encourage them to take that next step too, because it's a direct command from Jesus. So if you haven't been baptized yet and you'd like to, we'd love to have that conversation. But Jesus doesn't stop there. This disciple making, this inviting other people to follow Jesus also involves teaching them. Look at verse 20. Jesus says, teaching them, that's the new disciples, that's people that have decided to become followers of Jesus, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, right? New followers of Jesus are to be taught. We don't introduce someone to Jesus and then say, all right, go figure it out on your own. There's a lot to do. You can, I'm sure you can handle it. No, we don't do that. We teach them. Well, what do we teach? Look at what Jesus said in Matthew 28, verse 20. We teach them to observe all that he has commanded us to do. And the words here matter. Look at what Jesus said. Again, verse 20. Jesus doesn't say teach them to know and to memorize everything. Jesus doesn't say to, to make it an academic exercise where we just gain knowledge, although that knowledge is important. Jesus is concerned here with how we live. He wants us to teach people who would follow after him what he said and how then to put it into practice. He wants us to teach people how to live in a manner that's pleasing to God, right? We want what Jesus said to make it from our head down into our heart and ultimately into our hands. And this teaching, it's not isolated to a programmed experience. Those experiences are good. They're necessary to get good, solid teaching from God's word. But, but teaching someone is a way of life. It's inviting them to walk with you through life and showing them how to navigate the different situations that, that are going to happen as we live as followers of Jesus in this world. So as we recap Matthew 28 so far, our mission as a church family is to tell people the good news of Jesus so that they too can trust in him. We want to see them baptized, brought into the family, and then we want to teach them. We want to live with them. We want to do life with them to show them how to live the way that God's called us to live. I think that we all know and understand that one day, as followers of Jesus, we're going to have the opportunity to spend eternity in heaven with Jesus. But while we're here, right, we have something that we're called to do. When one of my mentors passed away a couple years ago, I went to his home the day that, that he went to be with Jesus, and I actually picked up his Bible, and I began to flip through it. And I'll never forget what I found flipping through the inside cover. There was so much written down there, but at the very top he had written, God has given me a to-do list, and I haven't finished it yet. 
He understood that as long as he was here, he had a mission straight from God. God had commanded him, and God commands you and I as well, if we're followers of Jesus, to reach the world with the good news of Jesus. Right? And that command right there that we see is enough, and inviting people to, to be taught by the, the good news of Jesus is enough, but, but Jesus follows it up with the end of, of verse 20 with a promise for me and for you. He says this, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. If you're taking notes or if you're writing anything down, just write this down as our last note this morning, and that's this. It's Jesus is with us. I love how this ends. I love how, how the, this book of the Bible ends. I love how this command ends. He, he does not say, I will be with you in the future. He says, I am with you now. Jesus is with us. You know, my youngest kiddo is, is four years old, and, and like many young kids, he doesn't like to walk into a dark room by himself. There's this level of, of fear this level of uncertainty, this level of maybe uh, the unknown that, that waits for him in that dark room that, that slows him down. And if you think back to when you were a kid, you probably had the same thing. I know that, that I can remember when I was a kid, I, I didn't like to walk into a dark room. There, there was a fear that was there. So I understand where he's coming from when I say, hey, buddy, I need you to go do something. And the lights are off in the room that he's going into. He hesitates, right? But guess what? If daddy comes and goes with him, if, if I go and I hold his hand and I walk into that room with him, he has no fear. Right? He, he flies into that room to do whatever it is he needs to do because he knows that his dad is with him. And that no matter what he faces, no matter what there is waiting for him in that dark room, that his dad will protect him and that his dad will take care of him no matter what. And his disciples of Jesus... As followers of Jesus living out what he's called us to do, we have that same promise right here. He's telling us that, that we're not left alone in the unknown, trying hard to just figure things out the best that we can. Jesus promised us that he's with us every step of the way. So if you need hope or encouragement, if you need confidence to do what God's called you to do, read this again. Read it over and over that he is with us. He's not going anywhere. And knowing that Jesus is with us everywhere we go, every conversation we have at that lunch table, when we're with our friends, when Jesus is with us, it gives us the confidence to do what he's commanded us to do. You know, if we believe that Jesus is who he says he is, if we believe what God's word has to say, that we have a relationship with God because of what Jesus did on the cross, the only thing that makes sense, the only thing that makes sense is for us to do what he's called us to do. It's for us to invite other people into that same hope that we have in Jesus. And the opposite's also true. And it, as we read this, right, what just doesn't make sense would be a follower of Jesus walking through life with this living hope inside of us, saying nothing to the world around us that is in desperate need of hope. Followers of Jesus are called to invite others to follow Jesus. Right? The, the lost people in, in our neighborhoods who don't know Jesus, they're not commanded to go to church. But as we read the Bible, we see that the church is commanded to go to them. That's our purpose. That's our mission. That, that, that is who we are. That is what God has called us to do. His word clearly teaches that as a church family, as followers of Jesus, we should be inviting others to follow Jesus. Would you pray with me as we think about what, what God's word has to say? I, I just want all of us to pray together right here, right now, wherever you're watching, whoever you're with. Would you just pray, even out loud, say, God, help us to be a family that lives out our mission. Help us to be a family that takes the hope that you have placed in us and shares it freely and generously with the world around us. We're in a season of, of time right now where, where people are open. Where, where there's this level of just fear and uncertainty and people are looking for something that is certain and cast we have it, that relationship with Jesus. So let me just encourage you in every conversation, every situation, walk slow and think about the people that God is bringing in and out of your life right now. Who is it that God is calling you to share the hope of Jesus with? Who is it that God is asking you to invite into a relationship with him 
as well. And, and maybe today, uh, as soon as we're done with our time here and don't leave yet, we're about to celebrate baptism with some in our church family. But at some point today, right, when this is over, I want to encourage you to discuss as a family and to ask one another, are we inviting other people to follow Jesus? Are we living out the mission <clears throat> that God has called us to live out? And who are some people that God's placed in our life? Just like Amy had a friend at her lunch table. Who are some people that God has placed near us, close to us, that we can invest in and love enough to point to Jesus? And I know this too. I know that there are people that are watching this morning that, that might not be a part of our church family. You know what? You might be loved so much by someone in our church family that they've begun asking you to join us as we gather online. Maybe they've asked you to, to join as we gather in person at some point in the future. And so you're here, and this morning you're hearing about the hope that we have in Jesus. You're hearing that we can have a relationship with God through Jesus. And maybe you're saying this morning, you know what? Before I begin inviting other people into a relationship with Christ, I need to enter into a relationship with Christ. And if that is you, nothing would give us more joy. You saw Amy smile earlier, and nothing would give you more joy than trusting in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So if that's you, let me encourage you this morning to just text the number that you see on your screen right there. Just give us that first and last name, and one of our pastors or ministers would have the privilege and the honor to call you and just talk with you about through God's Word about what it means to step into a relationship with Jesus. Listen, we want you to follow Jesus. And as a church family, we want to make sure we're inviting others to follow Jesus. And I'll just leave us with this one last thought, and then we're going to celebrate baptism, and that's this. If the church, and that's you and that's me, if the church family doesn't invite other people to follow Jesus, no one else will. Let's fulfill the mission that God has given each and every one of us and celebrate as people place their faith and trust in him. And that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to celebrate two people that have placed their faith and trust in Jesus and want to share that with the world through baptism. Thank you, Stephen. And this morning we have an awesome opportunity, and it has been a while since we've gotten to experience life change as a church and get to celebrate with those that have, like Stephen said, placed their trust and faith in Jesus. And now we get to demonstrate what it means to be washed by the blood of the Lamb. And so this morning I have Rob and Paige Patterson with me. And backstage I got to hear their stories. And both stories just exemplified what it was to, to walk through a ton of life without Christ and then realize that there is only one person, there's one thing that can change and truly change your life, and, and that is Jesus. And so both of them have told me that they've placed their faith in Jesus Christ. So this morning, it is my privilege to get to baptize you too. Uh, and so I've got Paige right here. And so Paige, based on your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life from home. If you'll just celebrate and we just clap and we're so excited for them. So I'll have y'all switch places and Rob, same thing as you, just getting to hear your story and getting to see that God has changed your life. Um, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. Would you just celebrate from home with us this morning? Amen. So I couldn't hear you, but I know that, that just like we're clapping and celebrating here, you're clapping and celebrating at home. God is good and God is at work. And God is drawing people to himself. And I just want to invite you to, to join in with what God has called each and every one of us to do. My hope and prayer is that we would be a church family inviting other people to follow Jesus. This next week, we're excited to celebrate as a church family the Lord's Supper uh, together. You know, this will be a, a different new experience for us, but we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper however it is that we're gathered together. So look for details on that through the week, and we'll give you some information to begin preparing for that. But just know that it's going to be a special time of worship as we share the Lord's Supper together. Know that we love you. Know that we're praying for you. Know that we're here for you. We hope you have a great week. God bless, and we'll see you soon.